All right, so I'm being asked to talk about adjuvant therapy of breast cancer. Um, this is just looking at hazard ratios, I have no idea what that noise is, of uh, relapse according to tumor subtype over years. And you can see on the uh, left-hand side there the decade of, or the times of 86 to 92. And the, the sharp peak there, the gray line, are HER2 positive ER negative patients and just their uh, risk of relapse. And you can see between 2004 and 2008 what a remarkable effect our options for therapies have had in terms of substantially reducing the uh, risk of relapse, um, especially early for patients. So I'm going to break this into what's new with chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting and what's new with endocrine therapy. The front part's going to be really short. There's not much new in chemotherapy for early breast cancer. For patients who are hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, we are waiting for the publication of Taylor X to uh, define the predictive value of Oncotype DX in that intermediate recurrence score group, but I think we're still a couple years away from that data. Um, we're awaiting the publication of MINDAC which is looking at mammoprint and to see whether that has a predictive value in predicting benefit from chemotherapy over just clinical features. And we're waiting for completion of the responder trial, which is essentially the Oncotype lymph node positive trial. So I don't think we're any further along in looking at the different predictive um, genomic assays despite all of the marketing and all of the options that are out there. This is just to remind us about Taylor X, which was all lymph node negative hormone receptor positive patients. They rolled down what they considered to be the intermediate group to 11 to 25, um, and that is the group which has thousands of women who have been randomized to endocrine therapy with or without chemotherapy. And then the MINDAC trial, which is being run in Europe, is actually zero to three positive lymph nodes, and they're looking at clinical features plus the 70 gene profile and um, if there's discordance between the 70 gene profile and the clinical features, those patients are randomized to endocrine therapy uh, with or without chemotherapy. And then just to remind you about the responder trial, which is sort of like the uh, Taylor X trial, but with one to three positive lymph nodes. This is still accruing patients, and we'll have 8,000 patients in this trial with recurrence score of 25 or less who will be getting endocrine therapy with or without chemotherapy. So, I'd say for the ER positive hurts new negative patients, there's nothing new. Um, what's new with chemotherapy for your triple negative patients? There are a couple presentations that occurred this year at San Antonio looking at best sequence and dosing for anthracyclines and taxanes, uh, weekly or dose dense taxol, um, for whom can we avoid anthracyclines. Um, this was a um, data presented from the SWOG SO221 trial, uh, over 3,000 patients, and they were looking at um, AC either weekly or every two weeks, Taxol weekly or every two weeks, and um, looked at forearms. And essentially, across the board, um, there's no difference in how any of these things were given. Um, if you look at C, though, those are the triple negative patients. Um, and those are the patients who essentially were receiving dose-dense therapy. Um, so maybe a tiny hint in the triple negative patients that dose-dense was um, superior, but I don't think I'd use this trial to inform me on, on how to give chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting if I'm using anthracyclines and taxanes. I think all of us sort of have our favorite either dose-dense or AC every three or every two, and then weekly taxol. And I'm not sure you can use this data to help support really any of those one versus the other. They did look at, um, re-look at E1199, which was um, AC standardly followed by weekly taxol or every three-week taxol, weekly dose of taxol versus every three-week dose of taxol. And again, nothing really fell out here except in the triple negative patients. There was a suggestion that the weekly paclitaxel patients actually did better. I'm not sure how I could use any of this information to really influence. I think I'm still a dose dense AC followed by dose dense taxol, but I, I think um, you, you could look at these and, and make your decisions as, as you care. NSABP B49 is still not yet reported, and that's sort of the, the question of can we get rid of anthracyclines. This is two trials that actually got melded together. Um, this is uh, TAC, 
Um, if, you're gonna get, if you were randomized to the anthracycline arm, you had a choice. So you, the patients could either get TAC or AC followed by weekly paclitaxel, dose-dense AC followed by weekly paclitaxel, or dose-dense AC followed by dose-dense paclitaxel. So it's just whatever your favorite anthracycline arm versus TC times six. And that trial, I think, will be of interest to a lot of people, especially the UCLA group who continue to refuse to use anthracycline under any circumstance that I can tell. Um, so how about ER positive early breast cancer? I think this is where the most interesting data have been presented, and we've been waiting for the soft trial for a very long period of time. Um, but I think it's still confused right now by all the issues of five versus 10 years of tamoxifen. So we know that for a long time, adjuvant tamoxifen for five or greater years was recommended. There are genomic profiles that are in development or on the market right now that are being marketed as helping guide you as to who will benefit from endocrine therapy past five years. I think um, all of that data is a really slippery slope. Uh, all of those genomic profiles will tell you who's at high risk for relapsing after five years. They will not tell you whether they'll also benefit from endocrine therapy after five years. Um, where the, uh, the issue of ovarian function suppression has been a question for a very long period of time. And then we do know that women who do develop amenorrhea during chemotherapy do have a reduced risk of relapse. So all of those things have been known. These are just to remind us of the um, overview data on women who are young, who get tamoxifen, um, and these are the 15-year data. So these are all ER-positive patients who were randomly assigned in trials a long time ago between placebo or five years of tamoxifen, and just pulling apart the patients under 45 who were ER positive, you can see with five years of tamoxifen, at that five-year point, um, in terms of breast cancer mortality on the left, there's about a 3% absolute difference. Once the tamoxifen stopped, at 10 years, there's a 7% absolute difference. And at 15 years, now 10 years after the tamoxifen's been stopped, um, there's a 10% absolute difference in mortality. And on the right-hand side are any deaths, um, but again, just showing the, the benefit of the tamoxifen for just five years. So that's been our baseline for comparison of all other new endocrine therapies that are being considered. So the standard of care for tamoxifen has been five years, but greater than five years looks better in some. We have the uh, ATLAS trial and, and the ADAM trial suggesting. I think it's still difficult to figure out who you want to go past five years of tamoxifen. Um, and I think we still need some guidance and understanding not only who will relapse past five years, but will they benefit from more endocrine therapy and who those patients are. Um, the role of ovarian ablation um, in women with early premenopausal early breast cancer is part of soft trial. And then there are three trials that ask the question, ovarian ablation with an AI, soft, text, and the ABCSG12 trial. So let me walk through all this. Um, I'll just talk about the soft trial and then text and then ABCSG update. The soft trial um, is 3,000 women. They are all premenopausal going into this trial. It was part of the issues with prior trials Women had gotten chemotherapy and then they were randomized to ovarian ablation or not, but they, they weren't all premenopausal at that point. Some of them had been put into menopause from the chemotherapy. So the soft trial said you don't have to have chemotherapy. You could be premenopausal going into this trial if you're just going to use endocrine therapy you're in. If you get chemotherapy, you're allowed an eight months after chemotherapy to prove that you're still premenopausal. And in the interim, you can just be placed on tamoxifen, but at that eight month point, if you are not premenopausal at that point, you cannot be randomized. Otherwise, if you're premenopausal by having periods or by uh, FSH and estradiol testing, then you can go into this trial. So 3,000 women met that criteria. 47% of whom had not had chemotherapy, and 53% who did. And the randomization is one of three arms, tamoxifen for five years, um, tamoxifen plus ovarian suppression um, for five years, so ovarian suppression occurred all five years, or ovarian suppression plus the aromatase inhibitor exemestane. 
the statistical, primary statistical endpoint of this trial is just those first two, tamoxifen versus ovarian suppression plus tamoxifen. Secondary endpoints are looking at the AI question. Um, so there are about 1,000 patients per arm, and the ovarian suppression could be a GnRH agonist for five years, or you could do an oophorectomy, or you could radiate the ovaries, which is commonly done um, in Canada for ovarian suppression. The overall analysis from this trial is negative, which was the first two arms, tamoxifen versus ovarian suppression plus tamoxifen. Uh, these women are doing quite well. Um, and if you look at the event rate there, for those who got ovarian suppression, the five-year without an event is 86.6%, um, with just tamoxifen alone, 84.7%. I mean, in general, these women are doing really well. There's a, there's a numerical uh, difference between here, um, but, um, you know, you have to decide with these really slim numbers whether this is something you want to do uh, for your patients. In terms of the secondary objectives, they looked at disease-free survival, so tamoxifen, tamoxifen ovarian suppression, exemestane ovarian suppression, that's on the left, or breast cancer-free interval. So you can see the hazard ratios there. If you look at disease-free survival, the addition of ovarian suppression to tamoxifen had about a 17% improvement, not statistically significant, but the exemestane um, group, there was a little bit more suggestion that the AI was superior here. So when they looked at um, tamoxifen plus ovarian suppression versus tamoxifen, it's a relative 19% reduction in breast cancer recurrence, p-value 0.09. If you look at exemestane plus ovarian suppression versus tamoxifen, a relative 36% reduction and that did reach statistical significance, but it was a secondary statistical endpoint. Um, then they looked at patients who had chemotherapy versus not chemotherapy. Patients weren't randomized to chemotherapy, so presumably anybody who got chemotherapy was a higher risk patient, lymph node positive or something, or you're really worried about this young patient, you wanted to give her chemotherapy. And so those who were not thought to be high enough risk to receive chemotherapy see no benefit from the ovarian suppression here. So it appears to be those that are getting the chemotherapy and that uh, bottom gray line there is the tamoxifen patients um, alone, looking inferior here. So what is not part of the paper, as the presentation was being made at San Antonio, at that same time there was a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. This graph is not in the paper, which is interesting, because this to me is the most interesting part of these data, which is they pulled apart the women who are 35 or younger. And of those 3,000 women, that's only 350 patients who are 35 or younger, and that's consistent with the demographics of breast cancer. And so it's 11% of the overall population of the trial. Um, but when they looked at that group, 94% of them had received chemotherapy. And I think that makes sense. Our really young patients were tending to offer more chemotherapy. We're much more worried about them. And when you look at the five-year event-free survival or percentage without a breast cancer event after their randomization, for tamoxifen, it was about 68%. Uh, if you did tamoxifen and ovarian suppression, it's about 79%. And it's 83.5% if you use exemestane. And so you can see how the tamoxifen patients are really diving low below the other two ovarian suppression um, patients. So what is the cost of doing these kinds of treatments or doing ovarian suppression? From this trial, 15% of them had stopped their ovarian suppression randomization by the second year into the trial, and 22% of the women had stopped their ovarian suppression by three years. So they're, you know, they're not absolutely loving to be ovarian suppressed. Um, then there are provider-reported toxicities, which were thought to be clinically important. And what was quite fascinating to me is that 50% of patients are having symptoms of depression on this trial, 4% of which were severe. And there was about a 5% increase in this depression uh, when you added ovarian suppression. There were also an increase in other symptoms that the providers reported, menopausal symptoms, osteoporosis, insomnia were most marked. Patient reported symptoms, so quality of life um, outcomes were looked at in this trial, 
Global quality of life indicators don't really reflect endocrine toxicities. They're just sort of overall assessment of their health. Um, and the further they get out on the ovarian suppression, the less pronounced are the menopausal symptoms of the ovarian suppression. Um, and if patients had had chemotherapy, they had less problems with the ovarian suppression. So perhaps they already started into some ovarian suppression, but not complete enough to make them postmenopausal. All right, in that context, and also um, presented within um, the last year at ASCO, are the, the text and soft trials where they ask the question, we're gonna just suppress everybody. Let's pull out the tamoxifen group from soft. Let's look at the randomized studies of soft, which have ovarian suppression with tamoxifen versus exemestane, or the text trial, which is ovarian suppression uh, with tamoxifen versus exemestane. And they were allowed to combine those two groups together for this analysis, so it's called the joint analysis. So everybody's ovarian suppressed, now the question is tamoxifen versus exemestane. And when they looked at these data from text, if you look at the um, five-year difference of percent alive and disease-free, there's about a 4% uh, difference favoring exemestane. Um, and when you look at the forest plot that's on the right-hand side there, every group seems to have benefited from the randomization of exemestane versus tamoxifen. So if you look at this joint analysis, pulling out that tamoxifen question, disease-free survival, um, breast cancer-free interval, distant disease-free survival, all benefited being placed on the exemestane versus tamoxifen. If you suppress the ovaries, no difference in survival at this point. Uh, adverse events are some that you would expect. Uh, again, what was seen in this text trial, uh, depression, 50% of patients. Um, interesting, because I think we really haven't called that out much. And then patients on exemestane more likely to see the musculoskeletal effects, uh, the typical exemestane versus tamoxifen. Nothing was really new that was seen here. So I just want to put that in the context of ABCSG12 trial, which was reported a long time ago. And we talk about this trial because this was the one where we, they had zoledronic acid added here. These were 1,800 premenopausal women, almost none of whom had chemotherapy. They could only have it in the neoadjuvant setting if they had any. And it was tamoxifen. Everybody got ovarian suppression. So it was essentially tamoxifen versus anastrozole with this ovarian suppression. And when they look at the final analysis, um, there is no evidence that the aromatase inhibitor is superior. If anything, on overall survival, the tamoxifen sitting on that little bit higher curve, a better outcome. And so this really goes, it's large trial, very different from what we're seeing in soft text, where the exemestane has this enormous effect, um, especially in patients under 35. We're not seeing that in the ABCSG12 trial. So I just want to balance um, this presumption that we have to use an aromatase inhibitor here. So I think there are lots of evidence-based choices right now, tamoxifen or five versus 10 years. Uh, tamoxifen uh, for five years to an AI for five years, that's MA17, or ovarian suppression plus tamoxifen or ovarian suppression plus an AI. And if I were gonna do that, I'd probably choose exemestane based on soft and text. Um, Nancy Davidson spoke at the San Antonio meeting. These are her thoughts, actually, about how she would approach this, that for patients who are at sufficiently low risk to have relapse, she would decide between five and 10 years of tamoxifen. If you're going to consider ovarian suppression, uh, you would consider it in higher risk women, those who you think need chemotherapy for their risk factors, multiple positive lymph nodes, or age under 35. The optimal duration of ovarian suppression is not clear from this trial. So if you're gonna say, what if you ovarian suppress for 10 years? No data, no trial, no data, you're not gonna get that information. And so these were Hope Ruga, who also did a commentary at San Antonio, her way of looking at it, essentially low risk, which she defined uh, more specifically, tamoxifen for at least five years, um, high risk, ovarian suppression, probably tending towards exemestane, and, and intermediate risk. I think uh, all of us will struggle with a little bit. So our challenges are to um, look at predictive markers beyond hormone receptors, um, understanding pathways of resistance, optimizing the host environment, the BMI, 
um, long, monitoring long-term uh, benefit, but also toxicities of our patients if we're just going to ovarian suppress everybody. And then the issue of compliance. And lastly, I just want to talk about obesity because it may have an influence on your choices. Early breast cancer uh, trialist group at uh, ASCO this year collected data on 80,000 patients with early breast cancer, looking at the independent effects of BMI. Um, and they showed that obesity was independently associated with breast cancer-related mortality in premenopausal patients with ER-positive breast cancer. Um, there was little effect in premenopausal women with ER-negative breast cancer, so f um, and or in postmenopausal women, at least uh, at that time of that analysis, but a large number of patients. And when they looked at these women with premenopausal ER positive disease, of which there were 20,000 women, if you look at body mass index as it goes up, the breast cancer mortality, not overall mortality, but breast cancer mortality climbs with it. So a woman who's obese by the specific definition versus normal weight has a 34% increased risk of, develop, of dying from metastatic breast cancer. Lastly, ABCSG 12 trial has looked at this what now in terms of body mass index and its effect on the benefit of tamoxifen versus an aromatase inhibitor. So these are all premenopausal women, but they're being ovarian suppressed. And what they showed was that the hazard ratio um, and the effect of the endocrine therapy was inferior for these patients who had a high body mass index if you gave them the aromatase inhibitor. Um, and so there are some suggestions of worse outcome from AI, at least according to the ABCSG12 trial, when you have ovarian suppression here. So just a thought, if you're going to take your patient, take soft, ovarian suppress them, and she's a very obese patient, I'm not sure you're going to get quite the same benefit from the AI as you might tamoxifen. So although that's not what soft and text asked, I think this is very provocative information. Um, and again, same thing. This is looking at disease-free survival and then overall survival showing that tamoxifen may be superior with a high BMI patient. So my conclusions are these data are, are hypothesis generating, but they do suggest BMI influences the efficacy of the AI if you're going to ovarian suppress the patient. And because a third of women who are premenopausal are overweight or obese coming into their breast cancer diagnosis, I think it's something we need to think of. So my final conclusions are very little practice changing data in the use of adjuvant chemotherapy. Soft may present a new paradigm for ER positive early breast cancer premenopausal women, and you may want to consider the role of BMI when selecting your endocrine therapy in these women. Thank you very much.